Lord to come forward. A faithful Catholic, he loves the back seat, back pew. So it is time for us to have a change to come forward. Come. Come, 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 come. You can cool off for a few minutes and then you have to come front. Otherwise, I will call you out by name, which you don't want it. Okay? So I will do that. You know it already. Not the boy. Boy can stay where they are. In the choir would love the brothers upstairs to sing, yes. so you may go upstairs. Those brothers who can sing, you can go upstairs. All right, go, 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 go. Please praise and worship. You are on. We are officially going to start in two minutes' time. So you can settle down. of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for having gathered us here. We could have been in our respective homes, resting or watching TV or chatting out people's business, but here we are gathered in your name to deepen our Lenten understanding of the upcoming Passion Week which we are going to meditate and reflect on the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Touch our hearts, keep the ears of our souls open to receive and to hear your word spoken in the silence. Help us to enable our minds calm our spirits and to realize and to recognize why we are here and for what we have been gathered here. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.
upon Jesus. Jesus' name so sweet. Every rock me rock upon Jesus. Jesus' name so sweet. Jesus, Jesus. 
Hear, hear my cry, O oh Lord. I tell my friends. Of the earth will I cry out to thee. Wash me in my heart. Wash
Okay, good evening again, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good, good evening. evening. I'll be your MC for the evening. I'll sit sitting here with Janice, because I'm going to need some guidance. Uh, she's the master MC when it comes to these things. Good evening, Janice, how are you? Okay, so we normally have what is called a roll call. So I'm going to do the roll call. And I'm going to start with, is there anyone here from um, St. Helen and Mission? And the Mission, just so that you know, I have them written down here. We have St. Catherine of Siena. We have Our Lady of Perpetual Health and Sacred Heart Donington. Anybody from either of these places? No? Okay. <laughs> All right, do we have anyone from um, Brothers of the Poor? Missionaries of the Poor, yes? All right, good, good, good. Uh, do we have yeah, anyone yeah. from Reconciliation, by chance? Oh, look at that, all right. Anyone from St. Francis Xavier? All right, anyone from Atonement? Sweet, is that much church you want us to? <laughs> Uh, who did I leave out now? Anyone from St. Joseph by chance? Yes? Yeah. All right, good. And did I call all the churches? I did reconciliation. No, no, no. no I, here, yeah, I have it written down here, sorry. And anyone from St. Thomas More? <laughs> 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 uh, Jesus saved the best wine for last, you know. That's his first miracle was the best wine, don't it? All right, good. Sorry? Sorry, you see, that's why you said that, you know. Good Shepherd, is there anyone here from Good Shepherd? <laughs> why think I stand in here? Because I know they are here, so. All right, good. So that was roll call. So our theme for this evening is prayer and fasting, and that should be anything strange short. So I've been praying and fasting since we started on Ash Wednesday, and I've lost about eight pounds since Ash Wednesday, so I've been fasting a lot, yes? No? All right. So, prayer and fasting is our theme for this evening. And uh, we're going to have a very powerful, dynamic uh, presenter this evening. I won't say anything, I won't call his name yet. I'll allow the guest speak, our presenter, to introduce him. And um, I think I've done all what I should do. Has the, have I covered everything? Anything I'm supposed to do? Yes? Okay, okay good. All right, so we're going to have the, the, we're gonna have the reading first, and then we'll have the introduction of our guest speaker and then our presenter this evening will teach us a wonderful reflection on the reading. Thank you. 
que Dios está en ti. Heavenly Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we come to you this Sunday evening, Lord, on the fifth Sunday of Lent. Lord, we ask you to bear with us. We are unruly children. We come to repent. We have come, Lord, to get closer to you. Lord, as you journey with us in this Lenten season, we ask you, dear Jesus, to help us. Help our families, our friends, our church community, our city, our town, all of Jamaica, and all of the world, that we may enjoy peace. Peace. And we pray for peace in this Easter season. What is happening in the world, Lord, is devastating. We are destroying our world. Destroying mankind. Nuclear war is being talked about and saber rattling is taking place. We ask you, Lord, to listen to the missionaries that are here this evening. We ask you, Lord, to rest your hand upon us that we may go forth to be peacemakers. And all of this we ask in the name of your Son. Jesus, who lives and reigns with the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 6 and 16 to 18. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you and when you fast do not look dismal like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by men truly i say to you they have their reward but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. indeed and we also have um, a few deacons here so we have deacon Yisi back from is Miami right Florida yes they're here no Canada I was thinking okay from Canada and then we have deacon Evan from reconciliation and there's another deacon here <laughs> I don't know if anybody knew him uh, and myself uh, we'll call him this day um, during the sharing uh, we'll have the opportunity to go to confession so uh, Father Bernard, Father Lucas, and Father Hiller will hear confession so at different times. So by the statue of St. Joseph, that's one spot, and over where the canteen is where we eat, 
in the other area and then Father look at his office just pass that grill and go down to the gate he'll be there as well so that's an opportunity for you to go to confessions this evening so we are three three you'll be hearing confessions all right so I'm going to ask Dr. Beal to introduce our guest presenter for the evening from Sacred Heart is here as well. Okay. Father Thomas has been a priest for 24 years and is currently the pastor of St. Thomas More Catholic Church in Maypen. Father Thomas holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Dharmaram Vidya Kishrika in India and a master's degree in theology from the St. Joseph Seminary in New York. He's a former editor of the Catholic Opinion and former chairman of the Communications Commission of the Archdiocese between 2015 and 2021. He also served as the rector of St. Michael's Theological Seminary from 2020 to 2022. He was also the pastor at St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church, as well as at the Christ Redeemer Catholic Church. He teaches biblical literature, Pauline literature, and the synoptic gospels. Father Thomas, please come forward, and as he comes forward, we ask that we all stand and sing Spirit of the Living God. Good evening, my brothers and sisters. It's a blessing and a privilege to be here with you today, this evening, to share the word with you. I know those of you who know me would know this is not my voice. I kind of lost my voice for the last three, four days. And we just had our parish retreat with this broken voice. <clears throat> so what you have is what is left after the retreat. But only the voice is gone, but the brain is still there, you know? So I'm sure that we will have some wonderful time together with the Lord. 
And the theme that we have is a beautiful theme. It is praying and fasting, prayer and fasting. And now the theme is wonderful. Just that Father Lucas tied it up a little bit and he said prayer and fasting in the life of St. Joseph. And so I would need your help now for me to unravel this mystery. So tell me, where in the Bible can we find a reference to St. Saint Joseph praying? And that he fasting. If somebody can tell me, I would appreciate that. So I can start from there. Where in the Bible do we hear Saint P Saint Joseph praying? Anybody? Brothers? No? You couldn't help me? Well, we just don't have it. So even if you go back and look at the Bible, you won't find it. The Bible doesn't talk about St. Joseph praying or St. Joseph fasting. But I still have to talk about it. That's a theme that I'm given. So I'm going to try something to make it up, all right? So work with me. <clears throat> but before I go there, I want to start with a little story of the Old Testament. And I'm sure we all love stories. And you probably know this story already. This, this is a story of a man called Elijah. You know the prophet Elijah, don't you? He was the man who actually called God to come down from heaven and consume the animals that he had sacrificed, placed for sacrifice. And then God actually listened to his prayer. And God sent fire from heaven to consume the, the animal sacrifice so that he could prove to the people that he is the real God. Now, when that happened, he actually killed all the false gods false prophets of this God, of this Baal, the God of the, of the, of the um, Canaan, Canaanites. So he killed about 400 of them. And naturally, their patron, who was the prince, the, the queen, Jezebel, was looking for Elijah. She said, I'm going to kill him. By tomorrow, by this time, I would kill Elijah. So Elijah ran, ran for his life. He left Israel and ran to the kingdom of Judah. And when he reached there, he told his servants, no, you go on your way, I'm going away. And then he goes into the wilderness to hide away. Now, wilderness, we know, wilderness normally is associated with uh, a deprivation of self. It's a place you come face to face with the reality of who you are. You understand who you are because you have nothing else to hold on to but God. So there he actually was going back into his own self. I'm sure a lot of self-reflection took place while he was in the wilderness. And then he cried out to God and he said, Lord, it's enough. Take me. I have heard it enough. I am no better than my ancestors. So take me. And then he lay down to sleep. And the Lord responded to him by sending an angel with some bread and some water. And he gave him, wake him up and said, take, eat and drink. He ate and drank and lay down to sleep again. The angel went and came back with another dose of bread and water. Told him, take, eat, because the journey is going to be very long for you. Now he would eat the bread and drink the water. I don't know how you managed to do all of them in one sitting. Then he started to walk 40 days and 40 nights straight through the wilderness into Mount Horeb, there to meet the Lord. The story that I wanted to talk about is what happened when he went upon the mountain. He goes upon the mountain. This is the man who made God come down with fire and consume the sacrifice. He goes upon the mountain into a cave and hide away. And the Lord appeared and asked him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I want to talk to you because there is much, nothing much I can do. I have lost my effectiveness. Time to go. Take me away. And the Lord said, no, you still have things to do. Come out and see me. And then there was a big earthquake. And the God was not in the earthquake. Elijah wouldn't come out of the cave. There was a big tempest. Elijah wouldn't come out. God is not there. There's this fire and all of that magnificence. Elijah wouldn't come out. God is not there. Then there was this gentle breeze. 
And Elijah came out to see God. And he saw God face to face and communed with God. Now, I wanted to start with that. Because how did Elijah know that God is in the gentle breeze and not in the magnificence of earthquake or the fire or the tempest? How did Elijah know? And I believe this is where the key to prayer is. Prayer is something that happens to you internally, that challenges you, that changes you, transforms you in a way that you build a relationship with God in such a way you know the mind of God. You know the mind of God. It is as though God has direct communication with you. He knew that God is coming to him now in the gentle breeze, not in the fire, not in the tempest, not in the earthquake, but in this gentle breeze. Why? That's what prayer does to us. Now, I can't explain what prayer is really. Each of us will have our own personal definition of what prayer is. The saints will say, praying is the lifting up of our mind and heart to God. Some will say, prayer is communication with God. It's a dialogue. It is all true. Prayer is lifting up of our mind and heart to God. Prayer is dialogue. It is communication. It is conversation. It is more than that. Prayer is a relationship. Prayer is a relationship much like a married couple have a relationship. And the husband and wife are a boyfriend and a girlfriend deeply in love. I'm not talking about this infatuation, little puppy love business. We talk about deeply in love with each other. They don't have to communicate with anything. They just sit down beside each other, hold hands, nothing else matters. Time just simply flies. Hours can go by, they have to say absolutely nothing. But there is deep communication going on. Deep sense of relationship. They don't have to say anything without verbally saying anything. Internally, they are syncing with each other. They know what each person wants right there. Now, that's what happens to Elijah and God. Elijah has developed a prayer relationship, a communication with God, an internal relationship with God. I would say romantic, but perhaps it's deeper than romantic, more a mystical relationship with God in which he senses God is present there in that gentle breeze, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, not in the tempest. Why? God comes to you not in a mysterious way outside of your life. Many times we think God comes to us in a total strange manner. No, he comes to you in your lived experiences. For Elijah, the lived experience was the man who was in, in, in the wilderness, there he was, was challenged by his own sinfulness. He killed uh, 400 people. Not a nice thing. He's a fugitive, running away for his life. He hasn't confronted the reality of killing 400 people. It is true they are false prophets, but doesn't mean we don't like his seven Adventists, do we? Do we kill them around because we don't like them? They don't belong to a faith? No, we can't. So naturally, in the wilderness, he's challenged by that. Challenged by what he did. He's no better than the ancestors. They killed our believers, our prophets, and I killed the same thing. So he says, take me away. In his moment of brokenness, God comes to him in the gentleness that he could bring. That is compassion, mercy, love. God shares with him in the gentle breeze. That's why he can only see God in the gentleness that talks of God's kindness, compassion, sensitivity, and mercy. And so he comes out to see God. That's what prayer is. That's what prayer does to you. That's what happens to you when you pray. God talks to you, tells you, I am here. Come to me. Now, this is what we heard in the reading, too. It said, when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to God in secret. And the reading will continue to say, don't babble too many words like the hypocrites do. They like to make a show of it, stand up on the street corner, and list out long prayers 
No, that's not what God wants. God wants to hear your cry in the depths of your own heart. Like Elijah did. Quietly crying out to God for mercy. And God reaches out to him in pray, his prayer. And so he says, when you pray, go to your room, shut the door. Yeah, um, not literally. We might need to do that literally. You might need to go to your room, shut the door, so nobody can come around and disturb you. But that's not what it really means. It means shut the door of your senses so that the world doesn't get into you. So that, in other words, you need to just lock off your ears. I don't mean to say clog it up with some little cotton or something. You mean to say that you have to restrict your hearing, your sense of hearing, your sense of seeing. You can see, but don't see it. You can hear, but don't hear it. You do that very well, you know. Some of you may be doing it right now. You may be looking straight into my eyes as if you're listening to me, but you're not here. You're somewhere else right now. Maybe in Old Arbor. Maybe in Clarendon, in Maypen. You look through me as if you're watching, but you're not seeing here. You're gone somewhere else. Mind is somewhere else. That's what you mean to say, cut down, lock off your door. The doors, that senses by which the external world gets into you. Turn it off, lock it off, so that God can speak to you in the depths of your own heart. That's the prayer. That's the prayer. Now, how does this connect with St. Joseph? You might want to know that. No. Now, this is where St. Joseph has got to come into the picture. St. Joseph is God's choice instrument, chosen instrument, through whom God is going to care for his son Jesus in the world. The word becomes flesh and dwelt in our midst, in the womb of Mary. So St. Joseph now hears the story that Mary, his betrothed, is pregnant. Man, what do you want her to do right away? What every man would want to do? She pregnant? We don't even touch her. How this happened? And so he has some serious questions. And he went to pray. Went to sleep. Wake up in the morning. He said, you know what? I'm going to call the rabbi and tell him this thing can't go on. I'm going to divorce her. Send her back quietly. Because if I say that she is infidel, that means if she was, she, was, she was unfaithful to me, then they're going to stone her to death. And I don't want that to happen. His heart couldn't let that happen. She made a mistake maybe. That's okay. She had to live with it. I'm not going to have her blood on my, on my hand. So I'm going to tell Rabbi, let's divorce her, send her back. To the world, it may seem like my picnic that she'll go carry. But I know before God, it's not my picnic. That night, he goes to pray and then go to sleep, I'm sure. In his sleep, he has a dream. And this angel appears to him and says, Joseph, Mary has within her the child. The child is conceived of God, not, not of you, yes. Take Mary as your wife. That child is God's child. Now that aspect of him hearing the angel talking to him comes because of what I would call a prayer. God talked to him internally. Now it's not like he had a little bit of phone call, message comes and take up the phone and then it's a video call comes and the angel appears from heaven and says, hey, Joseph, how are you? Everything cool? Yeah, go on, go take Mary, man. No, everything is all right. We take care of it. It's not so. It's something that he heard within, as if an angel talking to him. He must not believe what he heard internally. But that's what prayer does to you. Prayer gives you the conviction that it is God who is talking to you. Like, just like Elijah, he had the conviction that God is not in that tempest. God is not in the fire. God is not in that earthquake. And when the gentle breeze came, he knew God is present in the gentle breeze. That conviction came because of his intimacy with God. It's that intimacy with God that Joseph had developed, which is, what, which is why God chose Joseph. Because he is a man of prayer, a man who knows the mind of God. So God knows that he is the right person who would understand the mystery of my son becoming one with man in human flesh. And so God chooses Joseph, just like God chooses Mary. 
we always talk about God choosing Mary, the angel Gabriel going and the giving the message. But we don't talk about the annunciation to Joseph. The annunciation to Joseph is when the angel tells him the child that she has is a child of God. So you must be the father to look after this child. He was called too, just like Mary was called. Unlike Mary who said, how do I know that this is a child of God? I don't know the man. Joseph didn't argue. Because in his mind, there was this conviction. Prayer leads to the conviction that it is God who is talking to you internally. It's that conviction that makes Joseph to say, all right, I will take Mary as my wife. Prayer. How many of us can say that our prayer gives us that conviction that God hears our prayer? Our prayers are usually a long list of things that we want from God, isn't it? God is like the ATM machine. When we want money, we go to God. God is like the hospital. When we want good health, go look for a doctor, get some medication, get better. We treat God like a merchandise. When we want something, we get it from him. He's a businessman who has plenty. When we want, we can get it from him. And many times it's credit. Then I pay him back. We don't. We don't even thank him sufficiently for all the blessings he gives into our life. But that's not what prayer really is, ought to be. Prayer ought to be creating within us an intimacy with God, one in which we know that there is this unique link, I will call the sink. God knows us and we know God. We know the mind of God. We know his plan. So what Jeremiah said, God told Jeremiah, I know I have a plan for you. Plan for your well-being, not for destruction. And Elijah recognizes that. And we need to recognize the plan that God has for us in anything that he calls us to do, in any, any way he chooses to do. We should have the conviction it is God who is calling me. And he who calls me will give you the grace that I need to accomplish what he wants of me. It's that conviction that comes from prayer is what indicates that you truly are a man or a woman of prayer. So the question really is, how do you know if you pray only if you, only you would know if you have the conviction in your heart, if you have true faith in your heart to say, this is God's will for me and I accomplish it. But too many of us don't have that conviction. We just hit and run. If it hits, it hits. We fling a stone into the bush. If there is a dog, if it hits a dog, the dog is going to ball out. And many a times it not go ball out because we not hit it right. We think it is God's will. And oftentimes it is what we want to do, we do. Isn't that so? When we do what we want to do, when it don't happen the way we want to happen, then we turn to God, the last resort. When everybody else say it can't be done, then we turn to God, Lord, how you make me waste all this money? What am I supposed to do now? Now you expect God to fix the problem that you created. When you never consulted him from the first hand, he would have told you that's not gonna work. Why you waste your money? God is always the last resort. But it must be the other way around. God must be the first resort. The only resort that we need. We go to God, communicate with him, and ask him, Lord, what should I do? Which is what Joseph did. Went to prayer. And you waited, and he waited, and he didn't hear an answer. He said, you know what? Tomorrow morning, I go to the rabbi and tell him, this is it. Because I don't know what else I can do. Maybe the first instance of what he heard, he is not going to tell, this is not my child, and scandalize Mary, so she can be stoned to death. That inspiration itself comes from God. If that was so. Because he sensed he didn't want Mary to be humiliated. He didn't want Mary to be embarrassed. He didn't want Mary to be accused of infidelity. That in itself comes from God. Understanding, sensitivity, compassion for Mary. Not fully understanding what is going on. At least he had the compassion. 
A sense of compassion is always coming from God. It is an experience that you have felt in the way that God has dealt with you. That's really what prayer does. Prayer changes you. Prayer transforms you. You have been at one with God. You talk to God and say, Lord, I have made mistakes because I didn't know what I'm doing. And God is going to say, all right, I recognize you made a mistake. I know that you are sorry for what you have done. I recognize I'm having compassion on you. I'll give you a second chance. We have that sense of God giving us so many second chance. Every time we turn to him and say, I made a mistake. It is that experience of God giving a second chance is what Joseph is now extending in his relationship to Mary. Giving her a second chance. Let me divorce her so she can live by herself with this child. Compassion. It's an experience that flows from your prayer. It's an experience to flow from your relationship with God in which you have felt compassion. You want to extend it to others. It flows from prayer. Prayer transforms you. Prayer transforms you. Because it creates within you a mystical union with God. God cannot but change you. If you give your life to God in prayer, God cannot but change you. And Joseph is the perfect example of, of how God can change the man. And so he was seen as righteous because he lived with God and experienced this tenderness from God and he was ready to extend that in the case of Mary without fully knowing how this all came to be. Can we then in our own life extend a similar experience of God's mercy that we sense in our own self with one another? When we have asked God forgiveness, can we extend the mercy to others? Remember the story? How many times must I forgive my brother if he wrongs to me? Seventy times? Seven times? God says, no, seventy times, seven times. By the time you keep counting, you will lose counting. That's really why you meant seventy times, seven times. Don't count it. Give it to them generously. Nobody's going to fall to you so many times in a day. Be generous to show compassion, sensitivity, understanding to the other, as I have been to you. That's what prayer does. Transforms you internally. We need to pray. We need to pray. Our prayer ought to be shutting down the door so that internally we can communicate with God who dwells within. As the scripture reminded us, what we do in the quiet secrecy God who sees it, he will reward you internally. We don't need to be given external rewards. It's an internal reward. For Joseph, that conviction was internal. He knew Mary is not infidelity. Her conception was by God. And so internally he knew now, he, with that conviction, he will take Mary as his wife. We pray for that change to happen within. A transformation of becoming one with God in such a way that we are able to understand God's plan, God's will for us. We're able to extend that mercy that God gives us with one another as our human needs arise in our relationship with one another. Let prayer transform us. Let God hear our prayer. Let him create within us this fusion of God's mind and our mind. That we begin to sync with God Know the will of God, the plan of God. Recognize that God extends his mercy to us and likewise we must extend our mercy with one another. Let prayer transform us. The second theme is fasting. I would ask the same question. When did Joseph fast? Well, we don't know when Joseph fast. If we think fasting is giving up food, maybe he did when he heard his betrothed is with child, he probably fasted. Probably he couldn't swallow any food. Food wouldn't go inside. Isn't that what happens to us too? When we are grief stricken, we can't eat food. Uh, some of us actually need no more food that time than other time. But some of us are that way. Some of us just eat, eat, eat. In sorrow, we eat plenty food. Maybe Joseph the other way around. 
let's consider for our sake, for the sake of my preaching, Joseph decided to go fasting because he couldn't eat. Food wouldn't go down the throat. But that's just not the fasting they talk about. The fasting is not only giving up food. Fasting is also giving up other things. Joseph had to fast. And it's not just a fasting only for the London season like our deacon did. Deacon, that's good. Eight, eight pounds you lost, huh? Nice. Let me see what happens after Easter. If that fasting becomes feasting, Instead of eight pounds, we go put on 18 pounds back on the body. <laughs> it happens, don't we? As soon as the lend is over, bun and cheese are going to load up into the belly. No, in the case of Joseph, it is not so. It's not so much about food, giving up food. Perhaps he did in praying with God, communicating with God. Because we have seen that too. Elijah, 40 days he walked through without eating anything more. The divine food carried him through for 40 days. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness praying without food, after which he was hungry. So yeah, it is possible. When we go into a serious praying mode of seeking God's guidance, we may actually fast. We do that too. We fast. Next week, Friday, the, the Antilles Episcopal Conference is asking us to fast and pray for Haiti. That God may hear our prayers, bring relief to the sorrows of our people in Haiti. We may need to fast and pray for them. Necessary. But with Joseph, I'm not talking about the fasting from food. I'm talking about the fasting from his sense need, needs of the physical sense. That means he's a man. Man has his needs, no? No, man? 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 Men have their needs, don't they? I'm not talking about need for food. I'm talking about your human need, affection, sensual affection, sexual needs. Those are natural, no? It's natural for a man. So those needs need to be met too. Which is why Joseph married. Why do you think Joseph married? Contrary to... Where's Joseph here? You have no picture of Joseph? Joseph is dying here. No more. We want a live Joseph. Sometimes you will see him. Yes. Sometimes you will see the pictures of Joseph. Like a big old man with a long white gray hair. Uh, white hair. And Mary, a young 16-year-old girl standing beside. They put it in a way. We are afraid to show Joseph as a young man would have a need for Mary. And then he would not. He would have lived a chaste life. With such a pretty woman like Mary. But the reality is Joseph probably would have been 30 years old or 31 years old. Just about then when the young men in the Jewish culture would have got married. <clears throat> when, their marriage is when their livelihood is stabilized, they have a trade that they can make a little money, can look after themselves, can build a room to their father's house where he can have his wife to stay, then they will get married. He would have married a woman, 16, 17, 18 year old, young ladies. That's when they get married. So that would have been the ideal thing. Joseph would have been 13 year old, uh, 30 year old, and May Joseph would have been, Mary would have been 16, 17, 18 years old. A very nice, pretty lady. He married her so that he can have sexual relations with her and have a child of his own and have a family of his own. His physical needs are those. Nothing wrong with that. But then the ch things changed. She's pregnant and he has even touched her yet. How could this happen? By the Holy Spirit, the angel tells him. And now he must con be convinced of that, and he takes her. But now imagine how many of us would receive Holy Communion, and then at that same time would think of having sex with somebody else. In other words, if you're adoring the body of Christ here in the monstrance, place of a blessed sacrament exposed, would you be thinking of having sex with somebody? But that's really what happens in real life with Joseph. Joseph has Mary having baby in the belly as a living tabernacle. Later on, Joseph has Mary with the child Jesus within, which is God-man. He has convinced that this is a child of God. So the God's child is right there with you. 
Whether would you adore this child, care for him, and the mother who is chosen as the instrument, or would you think about having sex with her? So really, that's where the sacrifice is. That's where the fasting is. He has to fast from his sense need, his physical need for intimacy with the woman, which he is now willfully letting go for the greater good of God's glory. That's the fasting. Now, that's the fasting. Now, it's a fasting that not everybody is called to undertake. Yes, we priests are called to undertake. But married people have that need and they can exercise their need in their married life. But for us priests, it is very special, which is why we consider Joseph as a patron of chastity. For us, it is. Because his life teaches us a need to fast from the sense expression, sexual expression of our love and intimacy for the other person. Instead, we divert that towards God and towards the church. The church becomes our bride, so to say. There is a fasting expected. Joseph had to undergo that fast, fasting from sexual experience with Mary on account of Jesus, the child who is there with him. It's a great sacrifice. But for us, yes, we don't need that fasting in the world externally. So we can think of the fasting in terms of the giving of the food, maybe, in praying to God, asking for God's guidance. Maybe giving up some things. Maybe the TV, maybe the WhatsApp and our social media, so that we can focus on God, hearing God to, to communicate with us internally, deepening that intimacy with him. We need that too, remember? Cutting off the external senses, locking down the door so that God can talk to us in the privacy of our heart. So in order for prayer to be, fa to be fostered within us, we do need to fast from the social media. We do need to fast from the external world so that we actually have the mind and heart available for God to communicate with us. In that sense, fasting is applicable to you also. Joseph's fasting is deeper than what you and I can understand. A fasting from expression of sexuality with Mary. That's a fasting that he had to undergo. Not just merely for a particular season. It is right through, which is why we recognize Mary as a virgin, ever virgin. Not just simply before marriage, not just simply in giving birth to Jesus, but she's ever virgin all the way. We believe that Joseph and Mary never had an intercourse because they maintained the purity on account of the child who is placed in their care. They are the guardian of God's own life on earth. And so naturally, there is adoring of Jesus, who is God-man, right before them, in the sense they wouldn't have the mind and heart to think of se having sex with each other, have a family of their own, when God's child is with them, in their care, in their responsibility. Prayer and fasting goes well in Joseph's life. And it must go well in our life too. Which is why the church, right away, as soon as we begin our, our Lenten penance in Ash Wednesday, we have these readings to remind us how this Lent must go. How this preparation to celebrate the life of Jesus in our life, personally, ought to be in prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. We need fasting in order to be able to pray better. We need to be able to pray so that the intimacy will enable us to seek God. Nothing else. We will seek first the kingdom of God. All else will be given to us as well. So we won't need food and wealth and well health and all of those. We won't worry about them. They will be given to us as well as the need arises. That's the fasting that we need. Not to worry about things of this world, but focus on God so that God who deepens this intimacy with us, will provide for us what we need as we need. Today, let's pray for that grace. Grace to deepen our intimacy with God in prayer so that the prayer transforms us. It changes us to become like Christ. As we have experienced God's love and mercy in our life, it will enable us to exercise that love and mercy towards one another. In the process, we will see our relationship with people changes. Our relationship with things change. We begin to see things as given to us as and when the need arises. 
the people come to our life not to use and abuse them, but really to be able to recognize the mystery of God dwelling in them, just as we experience God's mystery in our prayer and in our intimacy. It's an experience that we have with God that we will in turn see it manifesting in one another. Prayer transforms us, and we want the prayer to transform us. Let's pray for that grace of deeper inner transformation that only God can effect in us because we pray, we commune with God, we create that intimacy with God so that God can begin to change us, transform us. We become like God in our relationship with people. We don't crave for things and people. Instead, we begin to give glory to God in all that is placed at our disposal. Make sense to you? It's a challenge for us. In the remaining time of the Lenten season, we have this week, next week is Holy Week. Let us focus on deepening that intimacy with God because we need that. Jesus goes into the Gethsemane very soon. We will celebrate that. He goes to the Gethsemane. There he is going to meet God face to face in his sorrows, in his agony. He will pray so much so tears will flow out of his sweat. The blood will come out of his sweat to symbolize the agony of his heart. That talks about the oneness he creates with God and he will say, my father, if it is possible, remove this chalice away from me. But not my will, your will be done. Ultimately, turning himself over to God, that's what intimacy is all about. Recognizing God's plan is only through suffering will the Messiah come to glory. And so Jesus realizes. So he says, okay, not my will, let your will be done. And in that moment of surrender, he has said it, I will do what you plan for me. That's what we want in prayer. An intimacy with God so that we can fulfill God's will for us. We want to know that. We want to hear that. We want the conviction of it. And Jesus gets the conviction in his prayer in Gethsemane. We want to strengthen that conviction in our life. We want to strengthen the deepening of our intimacy with God so that we can truly face that moment of trial. Trust me, it's going to come to you very soon. I don't know how many of you actually had this experience on Ash Wednesday. Anybody feel hungry? On Ash Wednesday is a day of fasting and penance, no? You felt hungry? Actually, I felt hungry like about 7 o'clock in the morning. Other days, it's OK. I don't eat breakfast. I can go on. I don't eat lunch. It's OK. I can have a cup of coffee and tea, and I can go on through the day. The whole day, if I don't eat, I'm not dead, you know. I mean, all right. But on Ash Wednesday, 7 o'clock in the morning, hunger bite me. <laughs> 7 o'clock in the morning. And I don't leave the house and come out. I just around and go take a little walk around the house. I'm getting KFC just floating up in the air. Smell KFC. Like 7 o'clock in the morning. Really? Devil has a way of pulling you away, you know. Make you crave for chicken on, a, on an Ash Wednesday. Fasting and abstinence. You're not supposed to even eat. Think of meat. 7 o'clock in the morning. Freshly out of the bed. Come outside and getting ready for mass. I'm getting KFC smell floating up the air. I'm saying, no man, this is not real. So watch out for it now. The Gethsemane is coming your way. Gethsemane is coming your way. And the cross is waiting for you. You have got to deepen your intimacy with God so you know the cross that is coming to you is a sinless one. Not because of your mistakes. That's not the cross that we're worrying about, you know. The cross that we need to carry is the sins of others, not our sins as Jesus did. So we have to prepare for that. Yes, sacrament of reconciliation will help you to prepare that. Go confess your sins, get yourself ready, so that you know you are prepared to carry the cross of others, just as Jesus did. And for that, you have got to prepare, because the intimacy with God is needed, so that the strength of God can flow through you, enable you to carry the cross to Calvary. We need to fast from our sinfulness so that saintliness, holiness can enable us to carry the cross to Calvary. And so we pray for that grace today. Pray, pray, for, pray for the grace to deepen that intimacy with God so that we have the grace and the ability to fast from our sinful ways so that God's grace can enable us to carry the cross to Calvary meaningfully during this Lenten season. God bless you.
should know the goodness of God. Can I have a two or three persons telling us something about God's goodness? Whether in a length or before a length, but not too lengthy. Yeah. Eh? About God's goodness and his mercy in our lives. I want to say as Catholics, we pray for talk about God's goodness. I mean, I know one bit. The fact that when we wake up in the morning, is a blessing. Because we could have still be sleeping, not true. So why are we scared to talk about God's goodness? Oh, what a wonderful thing.
to, to tell us about God's goodness. Amen? Amen. I know if I don't come up here, Janice, is that for the start, right? And you want them to come up. All right, you say the thing that you normally say at the beginning. Shall we praise the Lord? So many things to give God thanks for, and I'm going to choose a simple one. Uh, two weeks ago, we were asked after Mass, um, Deacon and I, to go to St. Helens to meet Donna Marie Chambers, because we're going to travel to Donington to do the communion service. And it's felt like excitement, road trip for me. So we get there, and we're driving, we're driving. Archbishop um, organized the bus and everything. And we had drive and we had drive and then we leave St. Catherine and we leave St. Mary. You know, all right, it's some mango the lip on the road, orange and so on, but it's one whole hour. But we stop first at Guy's here, pick up the people at Our Lady of Perpetual Health, get to Donington. And it sounds so exciting. But by the time we reach home, mash up, 5.30, mash up in the evening. And of course, by Tuesday I have to call and say, I'm gonna work from home. That's so Tired. The Tuesday at work, Donna Marie calls me and says, I need you and Deacon to come to, um, I'm going to meet you 6.30 in the morning out by Food for the Poor, and we're going to go to um, St. Catherine of Siena in a U-Town, and then we're going to go to Lindsay, and you're going to do this. I said, look here, you know, Donna Marie, you're about to try to call my name again, and I'm like, nah, go with you, you know. <laughs> me, I'm going to think about this one hard, hard, hard. So I put down the phone. And the Lord said to me, but what a simple thing I ask you to do, just to go to two churches. It's not like it. You have to do it all the time. Remember, Donna Maria and Deacon David have to do it all the time. They've been doing it for more than a year. So I, I called Colin, and I said, Colin, Donna Maria asked me, you know, I could tell her, yes, just out of it. But we make sure to tell her, so we we'll now nah, come back for now, right? <laughs> And we went, and the Lord blessed us with the people that uh, we met there. When we got to St. Helens, Sunday came out, and after the second communion service, and when Donna Marie told us of the challenges that were happening, I said, Lord, thank you, God. Would I shame for no sin, would I tell her no, and give her a hard time, when we could have easily say yes, and we said, Lord, we thank you that in the prayer could have guided me to say to Colin, let us go, rather than tell him, we're not bothering. And just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that I did your will. So I'm gonna really shame for no seven never go. When this lady and her dear husband working so hard, and I would have refused because I wanted to be comfortable. So I really just want to thank the Lord for that. You know, just for allowing us to serve in that way, to say yes, Instead of what I wanted to say, after my go man, the place too far, you know, that kind of a thing. So thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I 
sat over her as she stepped on toward the line. In the morning, Mr. Lord, but I can't stay for the food a long day, no, because you have to clean her up and what have you and things, and call upon him, and call upon the Holy Spirit and say, give me the strength, give me the energy, give me the courage, get her up off the floor, get her on the bed, whatever to attend to her. Thursday. fall down our ground. Me say I stay down there now. Can me tell you say, if you want anything, call me. If you need to move, let me know say you need to move. Same thing again, she sleep on the floor Thursday, and me flown over a uh, night, make sure say everything okay with her. Couldn't get her up Friday morning. I had to call somebody and say, listen, my mother is on the floor, I can't get her. She come, so we try. Nothing, she called the fire station, them said they don't have no truck, what have you and things, she said, all right, come. We have a prayer, you know, cause the prayer thing works, so I don't know why I'm living that first thing in the morning again. So we pray again, I will get her up now and we get her in bed, we have to clean her up. I said, Lord, you still not listen to me, you know. What am I going to do? I know if I call on my, my people at Missionaries of the Poor or what have you, it may take a while for this to come in. And I'm starting to go through my road decks in my mind and say, who do I know, who can I call, who do I know, who can I call? And I, a friend of mine that we have been friends forever, since we were teenagers, he is now a JP, he's a lawyer, so he has a few contacts and what have you. And I called him and I said to him, listen, this is my situation. Can you organize to get me a wheelchair? And he said, wheelchair? He said, I'm going to house. <laughs> I said, thank you, Jesus. I never have to make a second phone call. And Saturday morning, this man drove from, I don't even know where he's living now, but he drove from wherever he's living, and he delivered that wheelchair to my house for my mother. And I blessed him, and I thank God that he has put people like this in my life in a time like this, and I want to say, praise the Lord. Father, so and so don't reach yet. No, a priest not here. I said, what the phone call. 
hold my car and break on that joint too. Um, but I join you, turn up. Communente. Turn up the hill, communente. Down the hill, communente. So, thank God you get out the tree. So I share that. But the other one that call, I, call, I call American mistake is that if after having a biopsy, I am supposed to be told that two of the medication I'm already on is not supposed to be taken. One called aspirin. And so I was, I had that experience. And I'm saying it's only God alone that could have done it his way. There's no other way. Only God alone could have done it that way. And so tonight I stand here testifying that I know that Jesus loves me and that he loves all of his servants, including me. I didn't have to be here today, but because of obedience, listening to 
God's word. Following his commands, he provided a direction that gave me a sense of healing. Two years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. A lot of women, of course, it was a fearful journey. But the God we serve put the right people in my midst. And today, I am here rejoicing. But during that journey, I got my test from God. I had to have faith. I remember when I was a child, Father, not Father Alvin, what's the other father? Father Bruce came to church one Sunday and spoke about the parable of the faith as small as the mustard seed. To believe that the God I serve can take you through any circumstance. Amen. Right? And when I went to my, I had one treatment to complete my therapy. You know, as a cancer patient, you go through chemotherapy. I had to do surgery. So I had radiation. And that test, that um, I did a CT scan. And that CT scan showed, oh, everything was OK, except there was something on the bone that they didn't like in my iliac bone. Oh, yes. And as a result of that, they would not proceed with the radiation. This is from August. And I did several tests, and it came back, it came back inconclusive. They could not progress. So the doctor, my hematologist, said, I'm going to proceed because she doesn't believe that it is a spread. Not because it says possible spread. She's not going to accept it. She wants me to proceed. However, there was a next doctor who said it was a spread. But you see, when God intervened, you see, when you believe in God, he can make the impossible possible. Amen? Amen. So the test showed that it was still a possible spread. And I was in limbo because I could not progress to radiation. This doctor said it's possible. The other one said it's possible. And that led me to December when I went back to my surgeons at Maypen and they said, let's do over a CT scan. My dear brothers and sisters, it's only God. It showed normal bone study. Normal bone study. So when I saw that, I said, I am happy. Father, I can enjoy my Christmas doing my church work. And come January, I went into private. Then again, they made me feel scared. They said, mm -mm. they're not satisfied with this bone study result. So the doctor that I am seeing now said, OK, Miss Gibson, let us do over the bone scan. He called me the Sunday before our Valentine's, Saturday before our Valentine's dinner, and he said, Miss Yvette, your condition is resolved. You can proceed to radiation. Only God. Only God. And I'm here standing as a witness, as a testimony, that there is nothing that is impossible once God is in the mix. You must ask. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and it must be found. And I am grateful to the man that has helped me through this. God. And I hope my testimony has touched someone heart. And if anybody is going through that challenge, don't be afraid. Talk it out. Because, because of talking, I got help. And because I got help, I am here with you.
I know you'll be fast in your pockets and putting it into a collection basket. So, um, can we just have some lively uh, music, Mr. Wisdom, for our collection? Thank you. Thank you to Father 
Dionysius for sharing on our theme this evening of prayer and fasting. I made copious notes, Father, as per usual. Uh, he taught me Pauline um, lessons when we were at the college learning. So, uh, first of all, prayer is special and different for each of us, to remind us. So, it comes in different forms, but at the end of the day, it's a matter of communicating with God and listening to Him. Uh, when we pray, we should shut the doors of distractions, whatever it is, uh, whether it's noise, whether it's the phone, whether it's the whatever it is, just shut the doors to allow that clear communication. Uh, our prayer must not be a hit and run thing. Our prayer to God must not be our last resort. It should be our first line of defense in asking God what is it he wants us to do. And most importantly, he says, prayer transforms us. And so we can't be the same person as we were before prayer and after prayer. And St. Joseph is a good example of God speaking to us and guiding us directly. So he spoke to St. Joseph in the dream and told him exactly what it, he wanted him to do. And that for him meant fasting for a lifetime. I never looked at it that way before, Father. But well, that was quite a powerful asking of St. Joseph to fast from certain things and um, to be the father that he was to our Lord and Savior. And last one at least, um, when we are grief stricken, sometimes we may fast from eating, but fasting can take other forms, such as fasting from distractions, fasting from things we enjoy, fasting from the social media. And so prayer and fasting works for St. Joseph, and so too it can work for us in our daily lives. We can face our Gethsemane through prayer and fasting. So thank you very much, Father, for those very enlightening and inspiring words this evening. Let me just give Father a warm round of applause. Father Bernard, is he, is he available? Yes, He's here in confessions, and the priests and deacons and sisters for, and the lay persons for organizing the two weeks, last Sunday and this Sunday, our Lenten service. And so we thank them very much for putting this together. Uh, we'd like to thank our musicians, um, St. Joseph Choir, and our able musician, Mr. Wisdom, along with the Mission brothers, missionary of the poor brothers, really made our evening very special. So can we just give them a warm round of applause? <laughs> I'd like to thank Sister Janice, who as usual, <laughs> can just call on her at a, at a moment's notice, and she just ably does what she does best. And Deacon, we, we, we think, thank you for your opening prayers this evening, and we're happy that you're here. And you'll be here with us for the Easter season, so we'll see him next Sunday as well. And last but not least, I'd like to thank you all for journeying from your various destinations to be here with us to make it the wonderful evening it has been. And may we have a safe um, journey back home. And when we leave after our prayer, we will have a, some refreshments over by the center there. So thank you again for coming out this evening. Uh, Father. <laughs> Shall we all please stand? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for having gathered us here, having touched our lives with the word to reflect and to meditate and to ponder as we head back to our separate destination. We ask you, Lord, to go before us to prepare a way. Go with us to protect all who are traveling so that we may reach our destination safe and sound. As we continue to prepare ourselves for the coming season of the Holy Week, help us to be open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and to live our lives in accord with the gospel values of love, justice, peace, and equality. We ask this through Christ our Lord, Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Have a blessed evening and safe travel home. Mm -hmm.